Okay, shalom everyone, and welcome to another Thursday night psalm study. We're looking at uh, Psalm 43, Part 1. And I titled the psalm study, The One Who Pleads on Our Behalf. And so, um, before we begin, let's open with a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together studying your word. And Lord, the reason we're here tonight is because we love you and we love your word, Lord, and we want to grow closer to you and uh, and how um, and just to get to know you better, Lord. We ask that you would uh, speak to our hearts tonight and that you would uh, help us to walk according to your ways. And we pray all these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. Okay. So uh, tonight's study is on Psalm 43. And uh, shalom, everyone. I'm, I'm glad everyone could be here tonight. And uh, I, I posted the link. Let me post that again. And at matsadi.com website. And so let me read through the psalm. This is a really short psalm this week, and then we'll get started here. In Psalm 43, there are five verses. And it says, Vindicate me, O God, and plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For why have you rejected... Or sorry, for, for you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre I shall praise you, O oh God, my God. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? And why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. And uh, that was for, from the New American Standard Bible. And so, this week's study, there are uh, five verses in the psalm, Psalm 43. And the psalm opens, and it says, Vindicate me, O God, and I plead my case against an ungodly nation. O deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. And when I was reading through this in the Hebrew Bible, I, re I read, uh, it said, Shaftani Elohim. The Riva Rivi Migoy, and what caught my attention was this this word Riva Rivi, and and so I I thought to talk about this a little in a little more detail here, and the Aramaic Targum it states that the it states that judge me O Lord with true judgment, for you are to argue my case with a people that is not righteous, from the deceitful and oppressive man you will save me, and then the Septuagint. The Greek translation, it says, A psalm of David, Judge me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Deliver me from the unjust and crafty man. And so, each translation, the, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the, the Greek, they, they seem to be in agreement here uh, with one another. And when reading the Hebrew text, it's written using the word shaftani in in the New American Standard Bible, they translate this as vindicate. And when looking up the word shaftani, it means to judge, you know, to judge me. And we know that um, shafat is to judge. So the shaftani is to judge me. And the Septuagint translates the word krinon, meaning to judge. And then in the Aramaic Targum, it uses the word don. And so, which means to, to discuss or to consider or to sentence or to, to accuse. So each of these translations are in agreement on the interpretation of the first verse of the psalm, having David asking the Lord to judge him. So I, my question is, why do you think David is asking God to judge him? Anyone have any comments on that? Why, why do you think... David's asking God, asking the Lord to judge him. And he makes an appeal to the Lord to judge him because he knows that the Lord is merciful. Um, yeah, you know, Ellie, you're right. So, man, it could be that he knows that God is merciful. I was thinking on the sense of that 
the Lord is merciful. He knows that. And so he would rather have God judge him rather than man. Because man can be very merciless, you know, unmerciful. And so um, when looking at uh, the Hebrew text, this, the words, Veriva Rivi Migoi, he asks the Lord to plead his case from an from the nation, you know, from a nation, from an ungodly nation. And the first, so I thought to look at for the first occurrence of the word reev in the Torah. And so, um, because, you know, in, when I first was reading through this psalm, I was like, well, I don't recognize this word. It was a word I didn't know. And um, generally, things can, like when I'm reading in Torah, it comes right out of the context. I can figure out what something means if, if I don't know that particular Hebrew word. But in the psalm, it's a lot more difficult, it seems. Um, and so, and I, I haven't been going through the psalm year after year or so. But, uh, so th I thought to look at this word reev in the Torah and using my Judaic classic software, I typed in reev, resh, yod, bet. And I found that there, the first occurrence, it occurs in parashat lech lecha. And that's in Genesis chapter 13, verses 7 to 8. And on the, at the bottom of page 2 and top of page 3, I list Genesis 13, verses 5 through 9. And that says, Now Lot, who went with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abraham, of Abram, his livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling in the land, and so Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, for nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right, and if to the right, I will go to the left. Okay, so we look at the, the Hebrew text for from the Torah in Genesis chapter 13 and we find that this word reev it's translated as strife or to strive and so based upon the Torah the men of Abram I wrote Abraham in here but you know Abram at the time his name wasn't changed yet and Lot they were the, their men were quarreling over the land for their cattle and the text says that they were striving together or arguing with one another you know who gets what part of the land and so, in this sense, it may be that David is asking the Lord to strive for his case, to argue on his behalf in the presence of the nations. Note that this is an ungodly nation. The Hebrew Scriptures, and when uh, we look at the, the uh, let's see, the Aramaic text, it says it comes from a not a righteous people. And in the, the New American Standard Bible, it says it comes from an ungodly nation. But in the, in the scriptures here, it just says migoi, you know, from the nations. And this is generally understood, I suppose, to be translated as um, being an ungodly nation because the nations were ungodly as compared to Israel. And so um, David's asking for the Lord to plead and to strive for his case in the presence of an ungodly nation. And the Hebrew simply states a negative term. It says that lo chasid, that meaning that not righteous or not pious. And it's important to note that the word uh, chasid is from the root word chesed, chesed, meaning grace or loving kindness. So David's understanding on the deliverance of the Lord is rooted within a covenant context. In a nation, he is asking the Lord to argue on his behalf against, is in, against an ungodly and wicked nation, one that is not in a covenant relationship with the Lord. Now David asks the Lord to deliver him from this ungodly nation, and that nation is... And so, you know, what nation is he referring to? And we, we might consider the following references from Parshiot... Beshalach, Shoftim, and Kitetzi. And um, Parashat Beshalach is from Exodus 13 to 17. Uh, Shoftim is from six, Deuteronomy 16 to 21. And Kitetzi is from Deuteronomy 21 to 25. 
And so on page 3 and 4, I list the section of verses we'll look at out of these parshas. Uh, from Exodus 17, verses 5 through 7, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand your staff, which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the, wa the rock, and water will come out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses, Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He named the place Massa and Mer Meribah because of the quarrel of the sons of Israel, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord coming, or is the Lord among us, or not? In Deuteronomy 21, verses 1 through 7, it says, and this is from Parashat Shemot, Oh, sorry, Shoftim, sorry, Shoftim. It says that if a slain person is found lying in the open country in the land, which the Lord your God gives you to possess, and it is not known who has struck him, then your elders and your judges shall go out and measure the distance to the cities which are around the slain one. It shall be that the city which is nearest to the slain man, that is, the elders of that city, shall take a heifer of the herd, which has not been worked, and which is not pulled in a yoke. The elders of that city shall bring the heifer down to a valley with running water, which has not been plowed or sown, and shall break the heifer's neck there in the valley. Then the priests of the son, sons of Levi shall come near, for the Lord our God has chosen them to serve him, to bless in the name of the Lord. And every dispute and every assault shall be settled by them. All the elders of that city, which is nearest to the slain man, shall wash their hands over the heifer, whose neck was blown, broken in the valley. And they shall answer and say, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it. And then from Prashat Kitetsi, from Deuteronomy 25, verse 1 through 3, it says that if there is a dispute between men and they go to court and the judges decide their case and they testify the righteous and the condemned, oh sorry, they testify, they justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, then it shall be if the wicked man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall then have or make him lie down and be beaten in his presence with a number of stripes according to his guilt. He may beat him forty times, but not more, so that he does not beat him with many more stripes than these, and your brother is not degraded in your eyes. Okay, so in each of these cases we find judgment, or we find uh, something going on with regard to the um, judgment, you know, it's going on to a pleading of a case before God. Now, according to, according to Parashat Beshalach, the scriptures state that the children of Israel quarreled with God and tested the Lord, asking where the Lord was among them, because there was no water. As a result, Moshe named the place Ma Masa and Meribah. In Parashat Shoftim, we read about the command regarding the slain man, or someone that's murdered. And according to the command, the heifer is brought to a valley with running water, its neck is broken, and the men were, who belong to the nearest city wash their hands over the heifer, stating that they did not kill this man. And the scriptures state that the Levites who are to judge over these things are to, to decide every dispute. And we find here in Deuteronomy 16, Deuteronomy, let's see, 21, that it says kol reeve. And so we find this word reeve again for um, striving or dispute. And in Parashat Kitetsi, we again read this, uh, the word reeve for dispute between two men who are taken to court. And the judges will decide uh, the case and justify their righteous and condemn the wicked. And within each of these cases, from a Torah perspective, the pleading or arguing over a dispute is performed in an orderly manner, manner and within the covenant context. Righteous and holy men sit as judges before God and hear the case. Therefore, when David asked for the Lord to plead his case against an ungodly nation, was he referring to men of Israel? Well, that's a question, you know. And this very well may be the case since he's asking for justice and vindication rather than deliverance. You know, so he may be asking for justice and vindication before his own people and rather than deliverance from an uh, ungodly nation, you know. I, I don't know, it's a possibility, just based on the, um, the analysis here. So David, he contrasts 
asking the Lord to plead for him on behalf of an unrighteous nation to the Lord delivering him from the deceitful and unjust man. Yeshua the Messiah said on the Sermon on the Mount, those who are gentle will inherit the earth. And the Greek word for gentle, uh, price, is a Greek price, is a Greek word for gentle, and has the meaning to be humble, meek, gentle, and submissive. And these qualities of gentleness show to be a response to faith and maturity, a faith that God controls the events of life. And a peacemaker provides us with the further meaning on what it means to be gentle. That a peacemaker does not have within his heart pride to overpower someone, but trusts in the Lord and seeks to make peace with all men. Yeshua goes on to say that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they will be satisfied. And the parallel is to those who are pure in heart will see God. And in these scriptures, one's soul is that which is thirsting and hungering for righteousness. And within the Torah context, the covenant relationship with the Lord and the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we should have a desire for righteousness. And this de desire should fill up our entire life. And just as we seek to find food and drink for our bodies in this world, we also should have a desire to seek after righteousness to give food and drink to our souls. Our food and drink is found in the Lord and for our spirit in the Word of God. So does anyone have any comments on that? I guess that's that's connected to our seeking the Lord for uh, to vindicate, you know, with regard to what David is saying here, vindicating his case, you know, seeking for justice. Um, what scripture were you thinking of, Ellie? Do you know it off offhand? <laughs> I'll keep going here. Okay, so David, he indicates, um, okay, says that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace in the Ruach. Yep, yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's, um, somewhere in Romans, you know. I don't know offhand. Okay, so David indicates this saying that the Lord is his strength. And he says in... Psalm 43, verse 2, For you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? So he appears to parallel the oppression of the enemy to the Lord rejecting him. And according to a previous psalm, Psalm 9, David states that the Lord abides forever and he has established his throne forever. And note that David says... He uses the word uh, le'olam, which is an adverb for forever, unfailing, or eternally. And the Lord is eternal, and therefore his judgment or his ruling will hold forever. And in Psalm 9, verses 7 through 10, it says, But the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment, and he will judge the world in righteousness. He will execute judgment for the peoples with equity. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So these scriptures are telling us that we can find refuge in the word of God and in the Lord God Almighty himself, that he is our strength and a place of hope during desperate times of life. And those who seek the Lord in his name those who know the name of God, who trust in him because they know he will never fail them. And that's what David is doing here. Um, the result of God's righteous judgment, his everlasting justice that has been established, he will be praised forever. In Psalm 9, verse 11, it says, Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare among the peoples his deeds. So how often today do people believe the Lord has forsaken them and in turn they themselves forsake the Lord? Because what David is saying here in Psalm 43 verse 2, he says that, For you are the God of my strength. Why have you rejected me? Why do, you, why do I go mourning? Because of the oppression of the enemy. And how often or have, has anyone here... Uh, 
felt like God has forsaken them. You know, and when we feel that the Lord has forsaken us, has there ever been, ever been a time when we feel like forsaking God because of that? You know, we feel wronged. You know, anyone ever anyone ever felt like that before? Um, to know the name of God, and we read in that psalm that uh, to know His name. So to know the name of God, is this a proof text for the sacred name movement? Anyone um, thought about that? I, I'm sure they use that. I don't follow the sacred name movement very often, but... Um, and yeah, right, Ellie, and um, that there are people, Ellie says that there are people who tell her that all the time that instead of, that they, that, you know, God has forsaken them, and instead of drawing closer, they fall away, and and that uh, sometimes that happens, and um, we need to pray that we can maintain the faith and be consistent in our walk before Him, no matter what the circumstance, you know. And um, Ellie also says that to know His name doesn't mean to insist on one particular favored pronunciation over another. To know His name is to know who He is, and I agree 100 percent. That's um, amen to that. <laughs> That's excellent, and. Um, so no, I don't believe this is a proof text for the sacred name movement. But um, to know the name of God is to know him according to his, his historical interaction with mankind. And this calls to remembrance all that he's done. And so we can focus upon his actions and who he is, a holy and righteous judge. And I believe that's what David was doing when he was writing the psalm. So today, we can call on the memory how the Lord has worked not only in Scripture and the lives of the men of faith we find in the Scriptures, but also in our own lives, including that which is um, oh, written in the Scriptures. I guess I, I didn't read ahead there, but uh, I just repeated that. <laughs> but yeah, I, we, can, we can look at our own lives and look back on our lives, and I can look back on my life and see how the Lord has kept me from sin and protected me and, and kept me whole and, and brought me through the hard times and, and brought blessing into my life. You know, it's, um, it's amazing. Let's see. All who know the Lord in this sense will put their trust in Him because He is actively working in the life of the believer. And a person may have a sense of being forsaken like David is saying here in Psalms 43 verse 2 or even in Psalm 22 verse 1 where um, the Messiah quoted this on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama zavachthani, you know, why, my God, why, my God, why have you forsaken me? But he has never forsaken us, you know. And this is implied in Psalm 37, verse 28, that the Lord forsaketh not his saints, and they are preserved forever. Now the Aramaic Targum, it says on Psalm 43, verse 2, it says, For you are God my strength, why have you abandoned me? Why do I go about in gloom at the oppression of the enemy? And then the Septuagint states, For thou, O God, art my strength, wherefore hast thou cast me off? And why do I go sad of countenance while the enemy oppresses me? And um, Ellie says that sometimes he withdraws his tangible presence to teach us to walk closer by faith. And you know, that is an excellent perspective. That is, that's an, that is a very good perspective. I agree. Now, the Aramaic Targum and the Septuagint, their translations, the obvious fact is that if we are opposed, or sorry, oppressed by our enemies, we are going to be depressed. And when we realize that we cannot save ourselves, we seek the Lord, and this may be the entire pro purpose of having trouble in life and so that we are continually reminded to turn to the Lord and to seek His face. Exactly what you're saying there, Ellie, in, in the room there, that uh, so teach us to walk closer to Him and to choose righteousness. You know, when someone asks me in person, uh, why did bad things happen? And I believe that the reason bad things do happen, that God allows these things to happen, is so that even in the midst of the pain, the hurt, and the sorrow, we choose righteousness. We choose justice. We choose faithfulness. And, I, and God is glorified. 
and we can see the power of God by His Spirit in our lives to help us to walk in those ways, you know, even in the midst of everything that's going on in our lives. And so that, that, that are bad, you know, or, and good. And so um, that, this, with this perspective, we can honestly state that all things work together for good, like, it's, like Paul said in Romans 8.28. And this may, may very well um, be the perspective that the Apostle Paul had when writing the letter to the Romans, in the sense that even in the midst of sorrow, we can uh, praise God and we can choose to walk in righteousness. We can choose to continue to have faith in the Lord and in our Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. Okay, so anyone have any comments on that? I don't think... Okay, so David continues in his psalm, and he says in Psalm 43, verse 3, O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. And so David asks that the light of God goes forth, and he states, Let them lead me. Who is he referring to on them lead me? Is it the light? What do you think on the light? Uh, have you been studying that <laughs> on the, the light of God? And what is the meaning of God sending forth his light? Anyone have any comments on that? And, you know, on Facebook, uh, I can't remember. Travis is his first name. I can't remember his last name, but... In in the on Facebook in the the Torah portions group, it was asked about the menorah, and why uh, why does it say that it's repeated that it is to be built according to the pattern that was shown on the mountain, and the other things it was not repeated, but it was only for the menorah that it was repeated, and um, something that I had thought I believe I answered that when I was when I was writing this psalm here. And but the answer I thought was that with regard to the menorah in in the Torah text it says that the light is designed in a way that the light shines forward you know only in the forward direction and what's interesting is that Mo Moshe saw this on the mountain the 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 menorah what it looked like and this uh, forward direction shining of the light and it reminded me of um, various scriptures. And um, I can't remember all the scriptures where the references are right now, but um, the sense of that the we know that God commands His light to go forth. He commands His word to go forth. We read in a, in another psalm, a previous psalm, that He commands His grace, His loving kindness, His chesed to go forth, to go forward. Um, there are things there's a, there's a scripture reference with regard to our righteousness shining as the sun so in, in what Yeshua said in um, I think it was in the book of Matthew I can't remember I don't know if I have it in here or not um, it might be in a Psalm 44 I think I might have added that in there but um, the, our, our righteousness goes forth you know, Yeshua said in Matthew 5 that our light is to shine forth to the nations, it goes before us, it goes in front of us. I remember in a past psalm that um, the Messiah goes before, you know, goes before God, goes and and leads the way. And uh, from the rabbinic literature, it might have been from the midrash, I can't remember. But um, all these things seem to be a characteristic of uh, who God is. That His righteousness goes forth, His love goes forth, His light goes forth, His mercy, His grace goes forth. And so this pattern that Moshe saw in, in heaven of the menorah that and the emphasis that is placed in the Torah text with regard to making exactly what you saw in heaven seems to indicate the kind of lives that we should have, that our love, our righteousness, our um, you know all these things that of who we are in the Messiah goes forth before us, you know, and um, I thought that was really neat and Let's see. Minister Althea says that the light of the Torah, light and lamp, the entrance of the Torah brings light. And um, yeah, yeah. And so, and Ellie says light is Torah. Okay. And so, um, 
in the study on page 5, we might gain a little bit of insight into this based upon what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 58. And so I quote from Isaiah 58 verse 3 to 59 verse 2, a significant portion of scripture here on page 6 of the study. And it says in these scriptures from Isaiah, and Ellie said in the room, also I am thinking of the verse in James about the father of lights where the light, we're the little lights. And yeah, yeah, that's a good reference to you. I remember that. And um, John in his epistles talks about having fellowship with darkness and light. You know, and so uh, there, I think there's a huge, huge, uh, uh, that's how I say it, uh, a huge, uh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> There's a, there's a, a, the light seems to con bring a connection throughout Scripture there, like I was explaining earlier. So, But um, anyway, Z Isaiah on page 6 of the study, it says, Why have you fasted and you do not see? Why have you humbled yourself and you do not notice? Behold, on the day of your fast, you find your desire and drive hard all your workers. Behold, you fast for contention and strife, and to strike with a wicked f fist. You do not fast like you do today to make your voice heard on high. Is it a fast like this which I choose a day for a man to humble himself? Is it for bowing one's head like a reed and for spreading out sackcloth and ashes as a bed? Will you call this a fast, even an acceptable day to the Lord? Is this not the fast which I choose to loosen the bonds of wickedness to undo the bands of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free, and break every yoke? Is it not to divide your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless poor into the house, when you see the naked, to cover him, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? When your light will break out like the dawn, and your recovery will speedily spring forth, and your righteousness will go before you, the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer. You will cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger speaking wit and speaking wickedness, and if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then your light will shine in darkness, and your gloom will become like midday. And the Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places and give strength to your bones, and you will be like a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. Those from among you will rebuild, rebuild the ancient ruins. You will rise up the age-old foundations, and you will be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the streets in which to dwell. If because of the this, this Shabbat you turn your foot from doing your own pleasure in, on my holy day, and call the Shabbat a delight, the holy day of the Lord, honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways, from seeking your own pleasure, and speaking your own word, then you will take delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his, hear, his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquity, iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Wow, that is an awesome scripture verse. He has awesome, um, awesome verse. Isaiah verses, you know, Isaiah begins speaking of fasting for the purpose of getting a response from the Lord. So the Lord will hear and save the nation. He says that the fasting of the people are for contention, strife, and to strike with a wicked fist. Who would fast for the with these things in mind? Anyone? Um, I mean, do you think that would a people really fast with that on, in mind? You know, for the purpose of strife and contention and to strike with a fist? I Man, this just seems unimaginable. But their fasting is for the purpose of making their voice heard on high and the people go about swaying, bowing the head, and laying upon sackcloth and ashes. And according to Isaiah, these things 
are not the purpose of fasting and in fact fasting for the purpose of loosing the bonds of wickedness to undo the bands of the yoke of slavery to let the oppressed go free to divide their bread with the hungry to give the poor a place to live and to clothe the naked Isaiah says that um, only, only then your light will break out like the dawn and your recovery will speedily spring forth and your righteousness will go before you the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard so here we find this going forth of light and righteousness in, in these, um, these verses here with Isaiah and in addition to this Isaiah says in Isaiah 58 verse 10 that if you give yourself to the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted then your light um, will rise in darkness and your gloom will become like midday and so the light that goes forth according to Isaiah here, are the righteous deeds that we do for others in the name of the Lord. And living righteously, doing good to the poor, and being innocent before the Lord our God, these are the things that Yeshua and the Messiah taught us when he said that what he did in Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 to 15. And on page 6 and page uh, 7, I quote that verse, and um, Shalom Sherry, it's good to see you. It's been, been some time since I've seen you. And so in Matthew 19, verse 13 to 15, it says that then some children were brought to him so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them, but Jesus said, Let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And after laying his hands on them, he departed from them. And so Yeshua said that the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And if we consider the children, what, what is Yeshua saying here? And I remember talking with someone regarding, uh, this is a few months back, and I was talking with someone regarding uh, the teaching ministry that I have here in the Psalms, and they asked that, you know, where is the fruit? Where is the fruit? You know, and um, I, I, one, one thing I, I talked about was with regard to um, turning someone to righteousness. And my goal, I guess, when studying these scriptures is to draw nearer to the Lord. And so we're looking at how we can deepen our faith and we can grow closer and how we can, um, we can, um, understand who we are in Christ and it's about maturity and growing in our faith and um, that that's kind of the fruit that I'm looking for and um, the the friend that I had he was a Christian and he was looking for just salvation and a lot of times it seems that um, the church is more interested in in just salvation and not growing up in the faith and if salvation is very important it is a very important part of um, who we are and sharing our faith and helping people to understand who the Messiah is and that they would come to faith in him but also maturity is is an important aspect and when when we look at this scripture it says that the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these is the fact that Yeshua is speaking of children a reference to being ignorant in the kingdom I don't think so and I, I think uh, I believe that this reference to children is being is a reference as being absolutely dependent upon our Father in heaven and being innocent before Him and doing um, being just and righteous. And and the thing is is like um, with regard to my son Lucas, he is so pure and innocent, and you just want to keep him that way forever, you know. He's so pure and innocent when he laughs and he smiles at you. It's like, oh, it breaks your heart, you know, that one day someone else will will harm him. It may may harm him in the future, you know, and you want to you just want to protect him. Yeah, you know, I I do. I, and and so, but um, when when we consider this verse in Matthew 19, that when Yeshua said the heaven the the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these these children, that um, he's I feel he's referring to children in a sense of being innocent and completely and absolutely dependent 
upon um, the parents for food. And that's the way we should be dependent upon our Father for life, for food, for everything. You know, and, and even in our understanding of Scripture, our faith, you know, everything that we're depending upon Him and His Spirit and the empowering of His Spirit for our lives, you know, walk before Him. And so, um, where was I in the study? Um, when, when considering children and their dependence on their parents for life, food, clothes, even being taught what is read, you know, we seek the Lord for His help to for truth you know and um in in ellie says that when we get older we want to depend on ourselves trying to my, make life work on our own where we need to all we need to realize that we need to depend on god because he is the one who you know guides and directs us right or at least we, we should be seeking him so that he can he can guide and direct us. but um we parents also they they give their children an understanding of who the Lord is. And uh, prayer teaches, teaches them how to pray. Uh, having relationship with others, our interactions with other people, he learns, their children will learn from that interaction. And um, how we deal with hard times and good times. Um, family, you know, interaction with family and how to love one another, um, you know, etc. And for all intents and purposes, the baby is considered poor also. You know, we think of that in the sense from the verse from Isaiah, the, um, an infant comes into life with nothing, you know, nothing on his back, just the skin, skin you know, and everything. And so um, became, because he, is, he would be considered poor because he came into this, into this world with nothing. And that we are to be in like manner, we are to be innocent, to take care of the poor, to provide for those who are in need. And the text in Isaiah concludes saying that, um, behold, in, I chose the conclusion here in 59, verse 1 and 2. It says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So the light that David is speaking of in the psalm, he's asking the Lord to send forth his light in his truth. And this is the very thing it seems to be that Isaiah is speaking of. And David says, Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Indicates that he's expecting the Lord to work in the hearts of his enemies. I, I felt that it may be that he, to work in the hearts of his enemies, to be kind to the poor and innocent, which he in, probably considers himself among that group, and then brings him to the holy hill of the Lord. Now, um, the holy hill was chosen by David, according to Second Chronicles chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, because the Lord had appeared to him there. And we read in Second Chronicles chapter 3, verses 1-2, through 2, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David, at the place that David had prepared on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. He began to build on the second day in the second month of the fourth year of his reign. So Solomon. So David asked the Lord to speak to the hearts of his enemy, enemies so that they would bring him to the holy mountain of God's dwelling place. Why are the mountains and the high places considered the dwelling places of the Lord God Almighty or even the, you know, the gods of the nations? Anyone uh, have any comments on that? Why are the high places, these hills, considered uh, dwelling places? I thought that might be an interesting little, little study to look at. And so just a thought that come across my mind. Um, according to the scriptures, high places were utilized as places of worship. And these were um, either elevated places of ground, raised, alt raised altars in the valley, or a place located on the top of a mountain. And... And Sherry says that in the room that their closeness to the heavens, yeah, that's... 
very good, very good possibility, right? And these elevated places, according to the Torah in Parashat Masay, Numbers 33, verse 52, in Parashat Bechukoti, in Le Leviticus 26, verse 30, high places were dedicated to idol worship by the nations, and especially among the Moabites, as we read in Isaiah 16, verse 12. These places often include an altar, along with a sacred object, such as a stone pillar or a wooden pole, to indicate the deity of worship. And in the Torah, the high place is translated from the Hebrew word uh, Bama, or Bamot in plural. And in the synagogue, this is referred to as the Bima, as high place. Um, and so, um, okay, so not all high places were dedicated to idol worship, and they played a major role in Israel's worship. For example, the earliest mention of the site of worship is found in Genesis chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, where Abraham built an altar to the Lord at Shechem in Hebron. Abraham also built an altar in the region of Moriah and was willing to sacrifice his son there at the Akita, you know, where he bound Isaac. And this is, in essence, Genesis 22. And this is the location that is traditionally believed to be the same place where the Lord spoke to David and King Solomon later built a temple in Jerusalem. Note also that Jacob set up a stone pillar to the Lord at Bethel, and Moshe met God on the mountain of Sinai, which is another uh, considered a high place. Now, reading on in the books of the prophets, Joshua set up stone pillars after crossing the Jordan, in Joshua 4.20, and considered this a high place of worship because the Israelites came up from the Jordan onto higher ground. The high places were visited regularly by the prophet Samuel. And one example is 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. High places were again mentioned as site, sites for Canaanite idol worship, according to Judges chapter 3, verse 19. And this extended into the period of Elijah and uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. Eli also mentions the word alia, which is to send up. Yep, good one. And according to the Torah, the Lord chose only one high place where the sacrifice was authorized, and that was the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, the Lord God commanded that all other high places be destroyed. And it was King Josiah who finally destroyed them, according to Second Kings verse 22, or, or ca chapter 22 to 23. So, in the Tanakh, the Bama is the high place is mentioned 117 times. We search for Bama in the Judaic classic software. It comes up 117 times. And they are uh, they were essentially the centers for Canaanite idol worship that Israel was commanded to tear down. However, these places became idols and that subtly seduced God's people year after year and we read in the biblical history that they seem to be unable to stay away from these high places. Now, um, what about today? Are the followers of the Messiah still tempted by the high places? Anyone have any comments on that? What do you think? Have you thought of that before? Uh, let's ask the question this way, in a, a slightly different way. What kinds of idols exist today that tempt believers? How about materialism, sex, and selfishness? What can we learn from the ancient idol worship at these high places? Um, what we can learn is that these places were a reoccurring or repetitive problem. And it was this very, it was, it was very seductive for the people of Israel, the fact that the high places are mentioned 117 times should lead us to study this a little more in depth. And according to 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 23, the Canaanites, it says that they built for themselves high places and sacred pillars in Esherim on every high hill and under every luxurant, luxurant tree. And um, Rahi asked the question, can we set up an indoor altar for Hashem even if we don't live in Israel? 
you know what? I wouldn't set up any altar whatsoever. I wouldn't do uh, I wouldn't do any of that, no matter where it's at. Okay, and when we look at this, the numerous times that the word Bama is referred to, a reference to in um, in the scriptures in the Tanakh, it would have been interesting to see how um, polluted the land of Israel was at that time with idol worship. You know, because it seems to indicate that every hill had a high place, every high place had an altar. It says under every luxuriant tree. Could you imagine? And um, and so um, I think that would have been fascinating just to to see what um, what kind of pollution the land was, what state it was in at that time. And before Israel crossed the Jordan into the Promised Land, Moshe exhorted the people to demolish all their high places, or they will become as pricks in their eyes and thorns in their sides as we read in Numbers chapter 33, verse 52 to 55. And Ellie says that only the heart and not a physical altar. And yeah, that, that's a good point. That is a good point. And um, Patricia says that the stones have to be special, yeah, uncut, you know, not shaped by human hand. And so um, then uh, the next question I have was what, what particularly was so dangerous about these Canaanite deities? And um, so we'll look at the the deities that were worshipped. I list that on page eight. And Rahi asks, why does it have to be stones? And I think that it has to be something that's built up on a solid foundation. Um, wood was used for burning, and they didn't have composite materials back then, like polymers or, or whatever. And so um, stone was it. You know, that's all they had. And you weren't to make bricks because that was fashioned by men's hands. And so. Um, there's a Torah command in Parashat Yitro. You can look that up. Uh, that uh, says that the, the stones are not to be cut. You know, you're supposed to build an altar from uncut stones. And so this would be something you find in nature. It's all natural. So, um, oh, I'm sure there were all kinds of altars. And, um, you know, the the altars in the, temp the, the tabernacle were um, bronze and gold. You know, the altar of incense and stuff like that. And so there were um, there were different kinds of altars. Now, the on page eight of the study, I list some of the Canaanite deities, and um, one of them is El, which is a singular word for God, and this is the supreme head of the Canaanite pantheon of gods, and supposedly the father of creation according to the Canaanite deities. There was another one, Baal, which is the lord of the earth and rain, and the Canaanites would pray to Baal for successful harvest on dry land, and so you see that um, that harvest and that harvest God, if you have a sense, that they would, um, you know, the Israelite people were an agricultural people, and so that there would be a draw there. Um, there was Ashtoreth, which is a goddess of fertility. So the Canaanite farmers visited her shrines to mate with cult prostitutes to guarantee a fertile crop or fertile cattle. Uh, there was the god Dagon, which is a principal deity of the Philistines, Dagon, and we read that in Samuel, you know, the, book is, the books of Samuel. And Dagon means grain in Hebrew and, and Ugarit. And in the Ugaritic text, it's associated with the wheat harvest. In 1 Chronicles 10, verse 8, chapter 8 through 10, no, verses 8 through 10, Chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. When the Philistines found King Saul's dead body on Mount Gilboa, they had fastened his head in the house of uh, Dagon. And, um, you know, Ellie says that uh, Baal is the wrong husband. Yeah, because Baal in Hebrew means husbandman. And, um, you know, it's interesting that you got Molech, which is uh, from the word Malach for king. You got Baal, which is the word Baal for our husband, and so you got these these false gods representing a false king and a, and a false husband. You know, I've never done a study on these these um, these things. And I think it would be an interesting study to see how the people were substituting the true husband and the true king. You know, for these false gods. I think that would be a neat study. But um, and the next the next Canaanite god was. Uh, Molech, and I just mentioned that, and it is an 
Ammonite deity to whom children were sacrificed. And um, I think that was in the Valley of Hinnom, right, where the word Gehenna comes from, that where the fires would... Um, they, they made the valley into a uh, place where they would toss the dead or toss trash and just keep the fire burning because it was defiled because of all the sacrifice, human sacrifices that was occurring in that valley to Molech. And then um, the last one I have on page 16 is Chemosh, and it's a Moabite deity, and they honored that deity with um, horrible, cruel rites like those of Molech, and they sacrificed children in, in the fire to Chemosh as well. And I got that from Unger's Bible Dictionary. So I list on page six, or sorry, page eight, only six of the 26 major Canaanite gods and goddesses. And the high places were not harmless shrines. You know, because today we think that we don't know the exact gravity or the weight of how wicked, all the wickedness that was going on in these shrines. But um, just from this small list, we can see how, how great wickedness it was, and it's not harmless, because it seems like it, being so distant in time from that time, it seems to be more harmless, you know. And God's people were seduced to sin and murder at these altars. And Isaiah, he rebuked them, and he said in Isaiah 57, verses 4 through 5, that you are not children of rebellion who inflame yourselves among the oaks under every luxuriant tree who slaughter the children in the ravines. And in addition to this, King Solomon succumbed to the high places by his Canaanite wives and built high places for Chemosh and Molech on the mountain east of Jerusalem. And we read that in, in history on, on Solomon's life that uh, he gave in to the, the will of his wives and these Canaanite, god, Canaanite gods and, and whatnot. And how could Solomon have been so deceived to commit human sacrifice in the murder of the innocent? I don't think that the scripture says specifically that he did that, but it does say that he created altars for these gods, and so one's got to wonder, you know? One's really got to wonder. And today, we don't construct idolatrous clay figurines of Baal or um, Ashtoreth, you know, etc., uh, or attend worship services, you know, with regard to these things. Uh, but our temptations and sin are just as seductive and perhaps even more subtle than these high places in these ancient days. And people today may avoid the obvious high places such as, such as theft child abuse, or explosive, explosive anger. However, we tend to be casual about other sins such as covetousness, envy, world, uh, sorry, worry, pride, sexual sin, gossip even, you know, and Lashon Hara, you know, and uh, strife, and even dishonoring our mother and our father, which is to name a few, and I got those right out of Galatians chapter 5 from the Apostolic Writings. And would you consider, do you, you think that these would be modern versions of the high places? What do you think? You know, I think they can be considered that, especially if we make it a altar or a high place in our hearts, you know. And, um, and so, some things to think about and consider in our own lives is that, is to ask, have I given myself permission to adapt a casual attitude towards sin? And the Lord commanded to drive out the inhabitants of the land of Canaan because, they're, because of their wickedness, not because of the righteousness of Israel. And we read that in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9. The Lord told Israel to take drastic measures to utterly destroy these places. And Yeshua himself even said to take drastic measures, gouge out your eye and cut off your hand if these things cause you to sin in Matthew chapter 5. Israel, on the other hand, took a casual attitude with regard to the idolatrous high places for 800 years because they were uh, intermingling with the locals, with the local nations. And Solomon is a great example of this, that he grew older and acquired more and more wives. 
and the wives turned, turned his heart away from the Lord and towards the gods of the nations. And, um, and Ellie says, yeah, um, thought of that stealing from God's glory. And Minister Alpheus says that uh, Ezekiel warns of idols in the heart, Ezekiel 14. And yeah, that, that's a good chapter. I like that chapter in Ezekiel. And um, Patricia says, not to be altered by man can read Maccabees in referring to the altars. And so, um, if we have taken a casual attitude towards sin, we will begin to consider these high places of worship in our lives over against the Lord God Almighty and Yeshua the Messiah. And as we entertain the worldly places in our hearts, our hearts will be drawn further and further from the Lord and our love for Yeshua, uh, Yeshua our Father in heaven, and our love for others will slip away. And we, so therefore we need to gain, guard our hearts very carefully. And there are so many things today that can draw us away and entice, entice us away from the Lord and from studying His Word and, and drawing near to Him and to loving others and whatnot. And so... Um, Anyone have any thought, further thoughts on that? That's all I had for that. But David, he continues in verse 4 in Psalm 43. And he says that, Then I will go to the altar of the Lord, to God my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre I shall praise you, O God my God. So how important is it to go to the altar with joy according to the Torah? And reading through the Torah in Parashat Rea, Deuteronomy 12, appears to parallel the psalm study thus far. And the following is a summary, and I'm on page 9 of the study, on Deuteronomy, a summary of Deuteronomy 12. And it says that, it states explicitly that these are the rules you must obey and be careful to follow in the land the Lord is giving you. Drive out the nations from the land and destroy all their high places where they worship their gods. Worship the Lord God the way it is described in the Torah, not in the way the nations serve and worship their gods. Bring your sacrifices to the place the Lord chooses and do so with joy. The Lord will choose a special place, Hamakom, the place, to establish his name. Do not eat meat with the blood in it, pour it on the ground. Be filled with joy in the sight of the Lord your God. Be joyful in all you do. These are connected to the sacrifice. And it's repeated the Lord will choose a special place, Hamakom, and bring the sacrifice the sacrifices to this place, do not eat meat with blood in it, and do not serve the Lord like the nations serve their gods, and do not be trapped by asking questions about their gods, saying, how do these nations serve their gods? We'll do it the same way. And the Lord hates this, and all the evil nations have committed in worshiping their gods. And so, I guess Deuteronomy 12 parallels the way we've kind of um, drashed out the psalm. It doesn't you know, follow the psalm explicitly, but... Um, how we've the the way the the study has been going, it seems to to follow a parallel here. But in the first verse of Deuteronomy 12, in the Hebrew Scriptures, we read that these are to be obeyed so that we may live upon the land. Ha'adama is the Hebrew word that's used here as the land. And what is important to note about this is that Moshe uses the word ha'adama rather than ha'aretz. And the difference in the word usage suggests that these scriptures apply for everyone and are not just in the land of Israel, you know, if we're inside or outside of the land. According to Parashat Lech Lecha, in Genesis 12 through 17, the Lord calls Abram to a new land. And in these scriptures we learn that the Lord desires for us to be obedient to his call on our lives. And the, Lord's God call, the Lord God calls on Abraham, Abram's life was to go out from his land, from his father's house, and from his people, to a land that he will show him. And the Lord promises to bless Abram and to make him into a great nation, and that those who bless him, the Lord will bless, and those who curse him, the Lord will curse. And in, in God's call on Abram, we read that the Lord promises that the Lord promises in him all the families of the earth would be blessed. And in this text right here, we see in the, in the Hebrew that the word that's used is Hadama and referring to earth, and it's used to indicate that all of the families of the earth will be blessed, and not just those who are in the land of Israel. 
And the reason this word is used to indicate that all will be blessed and does, and does not restrict a blessing to only those who are in the land of Israel. And the word Adama means ground based upon its use in Parashat Bereshit. And was the reason the first man was named Adam because he was made from the ground. And the scriptures here state that all of the families of the ground taken from the meaning that God created man from the dust of the earth. And we read Targum Onkelos, it states that all of the seed of the earth would be blessed, or the seed of the ground. And it's in this way that all the peoples of the earth are being referenced. The Hebrew scriptures reveal that the Lord's plan to extend the covenant to all peoples at a future time. And it's within these few verses, the Abrahamic covenant from Genesis 12, that all other covenants find their basis. The Mosaic covenant in the Torah expands the, coven the covenant of the promised land, Israel, establishing a dwelling place, Hamakom, um, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, where the Lord God makes his name known. In Parashat Rea, those who live upon the earth, Ha'adama, as we read in Parashat Rea, are to, oh, are to um, obey his commandments. And the importance of these commandments is to not walk in wickedness in our lives and not to follow the ways of the nations. Not in... Um, not to serve the Lord God the way the nations do in the scripture state explicitly in Deuteronomy 12 verse 8 through 9 you shall not do all that we are doing here today every man doing what is right in his own eyes for you have not as yet come to the resting place and the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you and that makes an interesting thought because we talk we we think about this place and in inheritance who, do we, who are we in Yeshua the Messiah? We have a place and in inheritance in the Messiah. So, we are not to walk according to what we think is right in our own lives, or in our own eyes. We are to walk according to the Torah, right? According to God's command. You know, that, that's, I think that's um, proof text right there, huh? <laughs> but um, we are told to be careful that we do not live doing whatever we feel is right in our own eyes and how often do we see that today you know scripture holds a significant weight in light of what the lord has done in yeshua these scriptures um hold a significant weight in light of what yeshua has done um we are to abide in him he says that and part of the command in the torah according to Deuteron deuteronomy 12 is to go before the lord with joy and thanksgiving and this is consistent with David's words in Psalm 43, verse 4. We bring it back to the psalm where it says that, Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy. And upon the lyre I shall praise you, O my God. So, going before the Lord with joy and thanksgiving, serving the Lord, seeking Him for our help and salvation, and destroying the ways of the nations, not serving the Lord the way the nations serve their gods. These are the things we do to remain in Mashiach, in the Messiah. Because honestly, can we live in sin and have fellowship with darkness and say we have fellowship with Yeshua and our Father in Heaven? I don't think so. This says in 1 John chapter 1. So David concludes his psalm, and he says in verse 5, why are you in despair, O my soul, and why are you disturbed within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. So David seems to be speaking to his own soul. Doesn't that seem odd? You know, I think I I was just thinking about this that it seems like he's speaking in the third person. Why do you think he talks that way? Is he speaking to us by way of writing that way? Yeah, and Ellie, he does write that a lot. And Minister Althea says that the Lord also requires for us to circumcise the foreskin of our hearts and not be stiff-necked. Right, exactly. And um, I believe that God helps us doing that too. And um, So... You know, David speaks in a third person, and I think that he may be speaking to us. And the point that he's making is that uh, is the trust in the Lord, no matter what the circumstance stance seems to suggest that the Lord has forsaken us. And there are times 
when it seems easy to trust in God's love, to rejoice in His salvation, and to sing because He has been good to us. There are other times, however, when that's not so easy. You know, if we're honest, I mean, really, sometimes it's not so easy, you know. In times when life is hard, when sorrow fills the heart, and we wonder if the Lord is even there for us like David is doing here in the psalm. In, in these times of suffering and struggle, we can still trust in God's, or can we still trust in God's love? And can we rejoice? And uh, we, can we sing with gladness to Him? And Psalm 13 tells us that we can. And reading through Psalm 13, verses 5 through 6, suggests that David was going through a time of blessing. However, based upon the entire psalm, David is feeling forgotten by God in the first verse of Psalm 13. And he is struggling with anguish and sorrow each day. And he is seeking, or he is seeing his enemies appear to prevail over him, and he's wondering how long this will go on. And in the midst of his desperation, David pauses to confess his, tr- his, his trust and joy in the Lord, and he sings to celebrate God's goodness. He accomplishes this by thinking back to times when the Lord has rescued him in the past, in Psalm 13, verse 5, and he remembers that the Lord has been good to him in, in verse 6 of Psalm 13. So remembering what the Lord has done in our own lives, and according to the scriptures, gives us confidence to trust and believe in the Lord to rescue us from our troubles. And David remembers what is true about the Lord and what is true regardless of the situation he is currently in. The Lord God is a God of unfailing love. And this unfailing love is what was revealed to us in the Messiah Yeshua. And Yeshua said that if we have seen him, we have seen the Father in heaven in John 14. And if we have Yeshua in our lives we have the help of the countenance of our Father in heaven. And so um, that concludes the, the psalm study. And, um, and so uh, let's, let's conclude in prayer here. Now I'll release the mic. Heavenly Father, we thank you for David's words, for helping us to think about our lives, our faith, and our trusting in you. We glorify you and give you praise because you have always kept your promises. Help us, Lord, to be a people of faith and let our lives reflect our faithfulness. We ask that you would empower us by your Spirit to walk in your ways and to follow Yeshua the Messiah and to produce good fruit. Help us to walk and abide in Christ as the scriptures say we are supposed to do in John chapter 14. Thank you, Lord for sending your Son Yeshua, that we may enter into the salvation that you have provided. We thank you for helping us to realize that observing the Torah is not a form of salvation by our own hands, but is the way in which we are to express our love for you. We thank you for helping us to grow in our faith and know who we are in the Messiah Yeshua. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to apply these truths to our lives. We praise your holy name and we give you all the honor and the glory and the praise forever and ever. Amen. In Yeshua's name we pray, amen. Okay.